All right, students. Let's end at the beginning. Dante's The Divine Comedy 2019, Lecture 27. This is our introductory lecture on Dante's parody. So, Cantos 1 through 5, The Sphere of the Moon. All right. So, we actually don't ascend into the divine or celestial paradise from terrestrial paradise until about 50 lines into the Paradiso. And so a couple interesting things just about the first two cantos of the Paradiso is that we do have an invocation to the muse as well as um, several new words being used, including a very famous word, transhumanar. Dante uses this word that means that he's going beyond human. Um, a couple other interesting things here, too, are that we are not clear exactly what the status of Dante's body is in Paradise. Paradise is a uh, largely non-physical place of the intellect, where cerebral or intellectual issues exist. It is a place of the mind. And in fact, the tenth circle of it, which comprises the whole of it, called the Empyrean, is the divine mind. So whether this is taking place within Dante's mind, or vice versa, Dante's mind is taking place in this without his body is entirely unclear. And that's part of the whole idea of transhumanar, or becoming more than human. Uh, something interesting there, too, and uh, what I'm told by a, a scholar from Digital Dante to look out for are ro references to Ovid. Uh, we see a reference to Marcius. Marcius, of course, was a man who tried to compete in a musical contest against Apollo, similar to what... Uh, uh, Dante is trying to do here by representing sort of the mind of God as well as hell uh, through language himself. Um, Marcius was known to compete against Apollo, and because of his hubris, because of his attempt to compete but losing, he was turned inside out. He was literally flayed. Uh, we also have a reference to Glaucus. Glaucus was a sea god who was once a mortal, but he was turned into the sea. He was turned into a god who became part of the sea, and the sea became part of him after eating a magical uh, herb. Well, that seems to be the idea behind Dante's mind and what's happening here. Is he part of the divine mind, or is the divine mind part of him? And again, is he in the Paradiso with his body and his mind, or just his mind? And would then the Paradiso uh, be in him, or would he be in it, like a man in the sea? Interesting. All right, a couple other symbols here. Beatrice. The most basic way to understand her is that she represents faith or Christian faith, whereas Virgil, if he is an allegory, represents reason. Well, reason has taken us as far as it possibly can. Got us to terrestrial paradise. Now we need faith for the deepest, most difficult philosophical and theological issues. And in fact, Beatrice, unlike the devils or the pagan gods that we ran into, or even the angels that we ran into on Purgatory, so we ran into pagan gods and uh, centaurs and all sorts of guardians down in the inferno, they would let us through, usually with a... Uh, uh, Virgil having to say something to them in the Inferno. Then in the Purgatorio, we'd have to do some legwork, and an angel would then whisper to us that we had found the gate. Well, now how we go from one sphere to another will be immediately. There will be literally no legwork done. Dante will not be doing much physical motion at all, because he will be doing mental work here. And so what will happen is that Beatrice will look somewhere, he will look at Beatrice, and then he will be immediately transported. It's sort of like how a teacher, when they're educating you, will say, okay, we're going to focus on this issue, and now let's turn our attention to another issue. You're thinking about something totally different, but do you actually have to physically move very much? No, and yet you have turned your mind to something else. In any case, know that Dante will move immediately, because Dante is moving in a world of thought right now, generally speaking, with his mind, and we will be expected to keep up. Something interesting else to notice too, is that Dante is unique in the epic tradition for Encanto 2 saying to us, um, turn back. He actually says, rather than come read, reader, he says, turn back or else the bark of your little vessel might get lost out on this sea of thought. Because he says, this is a hard book. This is a hard poem. And if you don't follow, you'll get lost like Ulysses. You'll see all sorts of nautical metaphors as well as references to Ovid in this very transformative work of the Paradiso. And so he actually says, if you're not ready, do not take the journey. That said, I think we are pretty well prepared. We will be taking the journey. Uh, one note, a similarity between Paradise and Inferno is that it is less human than the Purgatorio. Purgatorio, very human. Day, night, work, rest, and transformation. you got to do the work to have your life change. We all sort of understand that because you're all in high school right now. You are transforming your lives. You do work during the day. You do have to reflect 
at night. So it makes a lot of sense to you. Well, in Paradiso, the story's done. These people have made it to heaven. They are the jewels in the crown of humanity, is how they will literally be described. So, they're perfect now. So, all we have to do with them is to learn from them, because all they have to do at this point is to bathe us in their wisdom. So, nothing changes in the Paradiso, except for the fact that there are still people who die, go through the Purgatory, and make it to the Paradiso. So, when we see it as God sees it at the end, we're going to see it as humans see it, and then we will attain an ability to see it as a divinity at the very end, according to Dante, which might be a hubristic thing to say, we will see that there are actually several seats left open. Left open from whom, or for whom? Ideally, for the people who still have yet to live, and must die, and will then ascend to heaven. All right, good. Um, okay, one last weird thing to say. Just like the Odyssey, things are not quite as they appear in the Paradiso, because we see as humans, and yet everything exists there as gods. Humans don't see in the same way as gods do. The idea Dante will have about the God, the providential God of Christianity, is that he sees all time at once. Humans see time linearly. So a lot of things are going to be broken up into sections, which are actually one. Which means all the souls in the Paradiso are in the same place. They're actually in the tenth sphere called the Empyrean. But we're going to see them in nine spheres. Why? Well, in order to see as a human... You have to see distinctions between things, or it all just muddles together. So in order to understand in the way that the divine understands, we're going to have to see the parts, and then only after seeing all the parts will we see the what? The whole. Very good. The whole. All right, so a couple basic facts about this parody. So how is it laid out? So in the Inferno, we had nine circles. Several of the circles had subcircles, too. You remember we had the seventh circle, which split into three of the eight, split into ten bulges, and the ninth split into four distinct areas. Well, in the Purgatorio, we had seven levels, but before that, we had Anti-Purgatory, which was a sore with uh, two sorts of centers in it, the Late Repentance, which were split into three, and the Excommunicates, and we also had um, uh, or excuse me, Terrestrial Paradise on the top. So it was sort of like nine circles. Well, we have the same sort of idea here. We have nine spheres, because we will be going to the spheres, the, the uh, circles of heaven. They are the planets, as well as the sun and the stars. Um, we have nine of those spheres, as well as a tenth called the Empyrean, which comprises the whole. So, what's happening here? Where are we, where are we in the Paradiso? Well, Dante uses a geocentric model of the universe, or rather of the solar system, called Ptolemy's world system. Ptolemy was an ancient astronomer that believed that the Earth was at the center of the solar system, and that nine spheres would circle around, rotate around. And in fact, he had a very sophisticated account of that. He uses things like the, the equant and the, uh, the ecliptic and to explain the motion of the heavens around Earth. And of course, that's very sophisticated reasoning, though also obviously very wrong reasoning, because we know now, after the time of Galileo, that we do not live in a geocentric world, but rather a heliocentric world. And so his model is actually wrong. And so you'll notice something interesting here. The first closest sphere to Earth, where we will start in heaven, is the moon. The second, Mercury. The third, Venus. That all sounds right. The fourth, Sun. Well, that's actually the place that we occupy in the heliocentric model of the universe, uh, away from the Earth. Uh, is it? Is it? Is it is, or are we the third? I forget. Mercury, Venus, is, then it's us, right? Then are we the third and Mars the fourth? In any case, you see that the Sun is fourth farthest away in terms of size from us, um, and that is the place or unless it's the third, that we occupy in the actual heliocentric world. In any case, the sun is where we will go forth, and it is considered a sphere of heaven for Dante. He, notice that he doesn't make a strong distinction between stars and planets, because they didn't have astronomy quite as sophisticated as us. They didn't know that s stars were large gas uh, giants, essentially, and that planets were sort of rocky outgrowths that occasionally would have life on them, uh, though really Earth looks like the only one so far that we know about. In any case... The fifth sphere we'll go to is Mars. Sixth, Jupiter. Seven, Saturn. Eight has two names. It's either called the constellations or um, the fixed stars. There should be a nine right here. I'm sorry, it doesn't say nine. The ninth is the primum mobile, which means first mover. It's a term from Aristotle, an Aristotelian term. It's also called the crystalline heaven because it's invisible. We see through it. And then the tenth is the empyrean Notice that word pyre there again, like purgatory, like fire. 
in our language. So that's what the heavens look like. There are ten spheres. We're going to start on the first one. It's based on the geocentric model by Ptolemy. Cool. All right. A couple things about these spheres that are unique. Each sphere has assigned to it a unique virtue. And the first three spheres, since they are marred or obscured by the conical shadow of the earth, that would be if the sun were behind the earth, the earth would then cast a shadow, and that shadow would be on these first three planets, uh, though the sun has to be behind the earth and not in front of the earth, as it likely would be. But that's an error of Dante's, not of ours. And in any case, these first three spheres, beyond having their virtues, the moon has faith, Mercury hope, and Venus love, they are also slightly marred by imperfection. And so we see that there's not only <coughs> unity, bless you, in the Paradiso and diversity, but there's also perfection and imperfection, even in paradise, the most perfect place imaginable, literally imaginable, by Dante, there is still imperfection because it still involves humans. And so the moon, which has the virtue of faith, will actually meet someone there who's the, uh, the uh, grandmother of Manfred and the mother of Frederick II named Empress Constance. Her name literally means constant. Well, the vice is inconstancy or inconsistency, not keeping to your oath. Mercury, where the virtue is hope, well, the vice is too much ambition. He's and something interesting about Mercury is it's such a small planet that it doesn't get a lot of uh, fame in mythology or uh, astronomy or astrology at Dante's time. And so the people that wanted to be uh, very famous had the least famous uh, planet assigned to them, which I think is sort of interesting. And then Venus, the hot planet, representing love, is of course marred by, as you would expect, lust. Hmm. Each one of the planets or spheres also has a liberal art for the first seven of them assigned to it. And keep that in mind too. The first seven are going to be different from eight, nine, and ten, particularly because there are seven virtues, there are several, seven liberal arts, there are seven vices, but after that, we sort of run out of them. In fact, the eighth circle is going to be full of three of the theological virtues, not just one, but we'll get there when we get there. Sorry, it's called a sphere. In any case, here's another beautiful image of this. Again, you can see the earth in the middle. The moon, called Lunai, Mercury, Venus, Solus, uh, which is Venerous, you can see. That's where, sadly, the idea of vener venereal disease comes from. Solus, Sun, Martis, Mars, Jovis, Jupiter, Saturn, the uh, fixed stars. You see the crystalline heaven, uh, the prima mobile, and then the imperium surrounding all of it. Here's another beautiful image. I actually, at my home in Nashville, have an image of that framed above my bed. I think it's, well, the Ptolemaic world system is a complete world system. It's beautiful. We no longer have a complete world system because we know we don't know the entire universe. We know that it's expanding. And so uh, this was really the last time in time that humans thought that they really knew what everything was. And uh, it must have been nice. Must have been nice. All right, let's get to the sphere of the moon itself. So the theme. Well, if the virtue is faith, then we can assume that the theme is being constant or being consistent, which would be a way of describing being faithful over time. The virtue is, of course, faith, and the vice that mars it is inconsistency. So uh, the, the less consistent you are, the less faithful you are to your task. Well, concepts we're going to run into, uh, very simply explained, are the absolute will, which is called the will of God, which is always consistent and uniform, and also the contingent will. That's the will of man, not always consistent and uniform. In fact, the more faithful one is to one's destiny, the more one's contingent will reflects the absolute will for oneself. There is an interplay there, which means that you can actually literally have a destiny and live up to it by your own choice for Dante, or not live up to it by your own choice for Dante, or not making a choice because you were overcome by your own vice or sin, which would be a sad state to be in, which means you are enslaved to sin or vice, so you do not live out your destiny as you would have had you uh, uh, mastered your vice or sin. Two people we will meet here who will be shades, who um, we will just barely be able to see. The souls that we see at the very beginning here, we see uh, uh, very vaguely things will uh, sharpen up for us. As we go throughout the Paradiso, that's another theme. As we go higher into the Paradiso, 
Uh, Beatrice will get more beautiful. She actually gets more beautiful with each sphere, which means that Dante's sight is actually becoming more acute. He sees clearer and clearer, which is, I would say, an allegory for how you see as a human. The more you learn and the more uh, particular facts you learn on a map, the clearer you can see things and represent them to yourself. I know, very difficult concepts. In any case, two people we're going to meet. One is Picarda Donati. We've met a lot of Donatis. Remember, Farisi Donati and his Tensone down amongst the, um, the Gluttonous. Uh, yes, the Gluttonous? Yes, in any case. Also, Chiampa Donati. We met down amongst the thieves, and we heard about Corso Donati. Actually, we're going to hear more about him related to uh, Picarda here because he forced her to leave her convent in order to uh, marry for political gain. In any case, both of these women were nuns. Nuns are the female equivalent of monks. They are called sister, whereas monks are called brother. They are soror, whereas uh, monks are frater. That's why it says fra in front of their names, unless they're friars. Friars and monks are slightly different. Friars uh, go out into the world. Monks stay in their cloisters. Um, nuns are similar. And so nuns, the idea behind them is they wear a bridal ring because they've married to Christ. The idea is they stay faithful to Christ all their days in their convents, doing their praying and their chores. Unfortunately for these ladies, marred by inconstancy as they are, because they're both forced to leave their convents. And so we're going to have to ask why it is the case that they are considered less faithful, even though they are forced to leave and do not choose to leave themselves. That's one of the big questions from Paradiso. All right, these questions we're going to see again, except for one of them, uh, which I might just have to answer. These are the big questions from the first five cantos. And how the Paradiso works, since it is a place of pure intellect, is a place of philosophy. It's a place where you ask questions that go from a fact down to its first principle. And so here are the questions that we're going to have to clear up and understand the, an uh, the answers to by the end of today. If heaven is perfect and above the earth, it cannot be made of matter. But how do I, Dante, move in heaven if I have a body which is made of matter? We started talking about this. A little bit. He says, how can I be in a place that has no matter? It has potentially a slight bit of matter moving up to the prima mobile, which is the source of all change in motion in the universe, but not the same as like down here. In any case, how can Dante be in a place that's pure mind if he's not pure mind? Good question. Two, why does the moon appear to have dark spots if it is in heaven and heaven is perfect? I think that's a great question. It's a very childish question in a way. Here, let me show you a picture of the moon, just so you see that it's not perfect. Moon full of spots. How can that be perfect? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, good. Third question. How do humans take what they see with their senses, matter, and then understand what they see with their intellects? How do I take something which is physical outside of myself and then produce a sort of spiritual, intellectual image of it in my head? Do I actually see a rock and then take that rock into my head and then become a rock head? No, doesn't seem quite right. We're going to have to understand that. That's an old question of psychology. How do things that are out in the world somehow get into your head so that you can think about them? Do you ever think about that? <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Well, who does? Who does? In any case, four, this is a very important one. I found this, this is a very important one for people. This is one that I really, really focus on. This is probably the biggest question we're going to answer. What makes an oath unbreakable? When you make a promise or swear to someone, what is your guarantee of that promise? Dante will say it is God, and that actually you are offending God when you break a promise to somebody, which if you've ever had a promise broken to you, you might think that it was a pretty serious thing. And um, uh, you might even uh, start to think that human society is put together by the, a series of promises that we make to each other, and that perhaps we punish each other when we do not keep those promises. And perhaps that promise is codified into rules and into laws that we all agree to, especially in a free society like ours. In any case, agreements, very important. Five, if a vow is broken by the force of another, so this relates to Picarda Donati as well as Stamperis Constance, why would I be blamed for breaking the vow? That's a great question. If I'm not the reason that I broke a vow, somebody else forces me to break it, I'm supposed to stay in a convent forever, but my brother comes in violently, forces me to leave in order to marry, how is that my fault? Well, Dante's going to say... It's not that much of your fault. It's a little bit of your fault. And that's enough. That's enough. In any case. Six. This is, I think, one of the most interesting questions. And I don't even think I have a slide on it today. Why do souls not long for a higher place in paradise? 
Dante's going to be like, well, if there are ten spheres, and you're on the first lowest sphere, doesn't that mean that less of God has been revealed to you? Don't you want to see more? Don't you want to be higher in rank? And the girls are actually going to look at each other and smile embarrassed at him and be like, no, 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 Dante, and they'll explain that. And if I don't explain that to you today, you can ask me about that because the explanation is uh, pretty straightforward. Okay. Question number one. Let's start to answer it. If heaven is perfect and above the earth, it cannot be made of matter, but how do I, Dante, move into heaven if I have a body which is made of matter? Beatrice, <coughs> there are really two uh, characters who will be answering Dante during the course of the Paradiso. Beatrice will frequently answer him, and whoever his divine interlocutor is in a sphere. So he's going to get some responses from um, um, uh, Picarda Donati, but this particular response he gets from Beatrice before they show up. And so she will often sigh. Sometimes she will uh, look at him as if he's annoyed, but sometimes she'll look at him with eyes full of love as well, as if getting a good question fills her with love. Like, I would say, like a teacher receiving the perfect question from a student after giving a lecture, or something like that. In any case, all things created are part of a perfect order, Beatrice says. And you have to remember each part of this argument in order to get it set. This is a metaphor of a clock and a clockmaker. Recall I told you that Dante, using Ptolemy's uh, ideas about the universe, his geocentric model of the universe, believes the universe is perfect and perfectly made. And so if you think of a clock, a clock is perfectly made, and that each part within it functions in order to make the minute and the hour hand move. So each thing has its own purpose, and each thing is necessary in order to make the mechanism work, which is a beautiful metaphor to apply to human society, because that means that each person has a what then? A meaning or a purpose within human society. So, she then says, all things tend and strive towards their proper harbor. Notice that nautical metaphor again. Like how fire strains towards the sky. So each thing has a nature. Just like fire tries to go up, and just like water tries to go down, so does the human soul try to go to its proper spot as well. And since a human within its soul has the rational intellect or intelligence mixed with willpower, you can think up where you want to go, decide to go there, and then move yourself towards there. But you can also choose to depart from the course, unlike what Brunetto Latini said to us down in the Inferno, or be twisted by false delight. So, you have a choice of whether you wish to return to your proper harbor or do something else with your life. Uh, but, uh, obviously, you'll see from Dante's perspective, there is a best thing you can do with your time. All right. And so that is the explanation of how Dante has made it up here. The idea is he is the sort of person that is made in order to come up to heaven so that he, as a poet, can then see what he saw there and then transcribe it down. He has risen to his natural level. That's literally Beatrice's ex explanation. You've gotten to where you've gotten because you're the sort of person that was suppo supposed to get there. And so, very different from uh, modern explanations of how people get what they want, which often involve words like prejudice. In any case, not here. Number two, why does the moon appear to have dark spots if it is in heaven, and heaven is perfect? And actually, Dante gives, I would say, an accurate account of this. He says, oh, well, that's pretty easy. The darker spots are denser, and the lighter spots are rarer, meaning that certain parts have more matter, so they appear darker than others. Uh, another good explanation that he doesn't give could be that Certain spots on the moon could be farther away from us and certain closer, like there could be mountains on them. But all of this is wrong-minded of Dante. Remember, his paradise is not physical in large part. It is intellectual. So physical explanations are not going to do the job up here. And so the pilgrim tries his explanation, as I told you, involving material, but he's necessarily incorrect because there's, this is not going to be a materially rooted argument. So... First, Dante is wrong that the moon exists as a unity. When you look up and see that sphere, you think it's one. But he will say, actually, it's many. The moon itself that we think we see in the sky is actually an agglomeration of many of the souls that are in the moon. And in fact, some of them shine brighter than others, meaning that those that don't shine as brightly appear dark when they're next to them. In fact, there are some interesting sort of like IQ tests where they'll have like, a tube coming up across like six uh, uh, squares of 
that look gray, and the tube will cast a shadow on one of those squares next to another, and even though it's the same color as that square, because of perspective, it will appear different. I can show you an image of that soon. But in any case, just because uh, something bright is next to something dark does not mean that the thing that is less bright is actually dark or black. It just means that it, relative to the very bright object, is less bright. I know that sounds very difficult, but that's just sort of how it is. In any case, these spots or seeming marks of imperfection are actually due to our misperception of the fact that that which appears dark is only relatively dark due to the brightness of the soul surrounding it. So, the error is not in the heaven and how it appears. The error is in how we see, because we see in terms of difference rather than in terms of unity. Something you might well think of is that your eyes and your ears are made to notice things that stand out, that are discordant, that are different. But it is your mind that unifies the field together. And so, very interesting. In any case, all the souls of the moon, and this is starting to answer number six too, and in paradise, therefore, are perfect in accordance with their own nature. So this is also answering six. So part of the answer to why is it the case, why is it the case that souls in the moon do not long to be in a higher sphere of heaven? Well, an explanation that Picard and Constance will give to Dante is this. Each soul gets as much perfection as it is uh, capable of imbuing. And so, there are different levels of perfection that humans can attain to. There is a difference in the level of perfection that he, uh, or that means there are differences between people and how much uh, wisdom or truth or light of God, to put it prosaically, uh, can be revealed to them. However, you get just as much as you are capable of getting. It's just like sort of the difference in physical appetites that people have. Whereas one person can eat a 32-ounce steak and be okay, another person can eat a 6-ounce steak and be okay. It's the same with uh, people's relative ability to shine or understand the meaning of the heavens. Some people are great geniuses, like Bernard, and they're up at the top. And some people, like Picarda and Constance, they're very faithful, but they don't have quite as much light cast on them. And this is part of Dante's way of explaining that though everybody is one in one respect and has the same goal in one, everybody is also different. And people do different things with their time as well. Hmm, interesting. In any case, notice that theme of unity versus diversity. Here is, I think, a really pretty image uh, that is illustrating the point where you can see it looks like one, but when you look very closely, it's actually one image made out of many different faces. This is also the idea behind, say, the United States, and also a democracy. We have 50 states, and yet we have one nation. We have 350 million people, and yet we are all one people as well. This is an intellectual distinction. And you may notice that the greatest unities of people that exist, and the largest ones, are intellectual unities. Your family, you might have 20 people in it. You might have 100. You might have 10,000. But you don't have 350 million people in it. The greatest families, the largest groups of people, are intellectual groups of people. Generally, they are uh, political or religious in nature, in any case. There we go. All right. Number three. How do humans take what they see with their senses and then understand what they see with their intellects? I really like teaching this bit, too, because it teaches you how you break down things in your head. This is what happens. Oh, yes, and also something very profound that Dante has uh, said here, which sometimes students have problems with, but I've noticed because this stuff is so material, so difficult, sometimes they don't have a problem with it because it isn't the case that they understand what they see in front of them. They have shown themselves here. This is from 37 to 48. This is yet a third translation, the Durling translation of Dante. They have shown themselves here, not because the sphere is allotted to them, but to signify the celestial one that is least exalted, the moon. To speak thus to your understanding is necessary, for it takes from sense perception, what you see with your eyes, alone, what it makes worthy of intellection. Thinking. For this reason, Scripture, that's the Old and the New Testament, condescends to your faculties, attributing feet and hands to God, and meaning something different. That's a very radical thing Dante just said, especially for fundamentalist beliefs. And Holy Church represents Gabriel and Michael, those are angels, to you with human shape and other one who made Tobias whole. All right, so that's kind of crazy. Dante literally just had Beatrice say to him uh, that... The reason why in the Old and New Testament God is described as having a body is because people at the lowest level of thinking 
think in terms of bodies, but that God does not actually have a body. He says also that angels are represented with wings and arms because humans see in terms of creatures with uh, hands and arms, but that angels actually are intellectual concepts that when you think about them, you no longer need that sensible matter, matter for. That is a, a step beyond which most thinkers ever go to be able to consider that sort of idea. But this is Dante's explanation. This is how you, as a human, see for him. A human sees, with his or her eyes, a hole with its senses. Every human can do that. Not very special. Then, as a human, in your imagination, the thing that produces images that you have seen before, you can break that image into its constituent parts. When you break it into its constituent parts, that's called analyzing. And the word analyze actually means break away from. Uh, to loosen away from. Like if you were given a square with four parts in it, you could break the four parts apart. You'll notice you do this in math every single day. And then you could measure the sides of each of those four parts. And then you could know the sides of the full square. Well, the only reason you can do that is that you first see a full square. You then break it down in your imagination or on a piece of paper, which is a help to your imagination. And then you measure it with your intellect. And that's how you think as a human. So you then resynthesize the original unity with the newly acquired knowledge about the parts of the unity. And now you know the lengths of the square and understand the area or the essence of the square. And that's how you learn the nature of a thing. Uh, <laughs> which is, it's so funny when I explain that because that's like one of the most fundamental difficult things possible to understand as a human. And yet it was very clear, clearly and coherently put forward. And yet it's very difficult to understand. Isn't that funny? Something even clear and shining in front of you can be difficult to understand. You can see eyes drooping there, indicating that you see even less than you should. All right, but returning to the notion that paradise is all whole, though broken into parts for human perception, just as Aristotle says that the soul is all one, though it is logically divided in the intellect into three. Remember, you have your appetitive soul, you have your, or excuse me, you have your uh, vegetative soul, your locomotive soul, and your rational soul, well, those are all actually one, but they're split apart in your mind so that you can analyze what a human actually is. Uh, if you're the sort of human that does that sort of thing, which you're all required to do, so you're all those sorts of humans now. In any case, you see here that part of the project of paradise is to take that which we have seen with our eyes, but not thought of with our heads, or been taught of in a sensual way, like uh, God having feet or Gabriel wings, and to teach the pilgrim, and therefore us, how to correctly dismantle the image through questioning and analyze the parts and then put them back together as they were found, but with a symbolic understanding of the thing itself. Dante is literally trying to teach you how to think right now. He's not telling you what to think. He's telling you what you have to be capable of doing if you do not want to accept the thoughts of others. And obviously it's very difficult, and obviously that's why most people take pre-digested thoughts for themselves, like a microwave dinner of the mind, because thinking is very difficult to learn to do, and then once you can do it, it stays difficult. And so, you must be able to do this sort of thing if you wish to be able to think for yourself, according to Dante. One therefore notices that the process by which one will come truly to understand things is then threefold. Know the, these three parts. You learn something through the senses, you see it first, you analyze the function of each part of that which you have broken apart in your imagination, and then you correctly put it back together, and then you know something in a substantial way rather than in a skin-deep, superficial way. Hmm. It's also why you judge people by their actions. All right, next, let's talk about these two nuns that we meet who look like reflections in a deep pool. So we see them very unclearly. We're at the beginning of the parody. So as we go through here, we will see things in a much sharper way. We will sharpen up as we get through here. So the two sisters, as I said, are Picarda Donati, sister to Ferrisi Donati, uh, as well as Corso Donati, and Empress Constance. Now, they both took vows to be sisters, to serve as handmaidens to God, and be brides of Christ. That means they were going to become the profession or job of nuns, and they were going to devote themselves to faith and service. But, even though both of them made lifetime vows to remain forever faithful in their convent to God, both were forced, because of political or familial reasons, to leave their convents, Empress, or their convents. Empress Constance was forced out into marriage, and so was Picarda Donati. All right, so that makes a couple of questions 
pop up in our heads. First, we need to understand what an oath is for Dante. Then we need to understand why they're both still at fault, even though they were forced against their wills to do that which they willed not. Okay. Mm, do I want to explain it like this? I'll say, I'll just start here. Two things about an oath. Actually, I, I am going to start here. Two things you need to know about an oath to understand why they are so important to Dante is this. An oath is actively giving up your own freedom as a human in order to keep a, a compact with God. When you promise to do something, you have given up a piece of your freedom because you are saying that you are determined to do something at some time in some way and not everything else. Which is why a lot of people don't like to make choices using Danteistic reasoning. The other uh, thing that makes it so important is that a human's willpower, which comes from a human being intelligent, is according to Dante, the greatest gift humans were given by God. So to give up your greatest gift, your freedom of the will, in order to do something, potentially for someone else, if you promise them, is uh, the most profound thing you can possibly do as a human. It is the most divine thing as well. You uh, generously give up your freedom to do something for someone else, which is the most profound thing that you have, which uh, I just don't know how you could argue against that. In any case, there are two parts to an oath. This is going to help explain to us how you can break an oath and how you can keep an oath. The first part of the oath is the matter. That is the thing that you offer itself. So if you say, I'll give you $10 for that uh, uh, plush squid, for that uh, cuddly squid, uh, then $10 on the matter of the oath. Now, there's also a formal part of the oath, which is the oath itself. If you make a promise, an oath, uh, a compact with somebody, you cannot make it so that you do not have an oath. You can simply change the terms of that oath. Well, okay. How, how does that happen? Uh, how, what is it that I could possibly give to somebody in order to change the nature of an oath? So I can't change the fact that I made an oath. What is it that I can give to somebody to square it? Well, let me see, let me see. Where do I want to get to here? There we go. Good, good, good. good. Here's the ratio that I'm going to explain to you here. I had to move up a couple slides there because the others are important, though not necessarily material to this particular consideration. Dante says this. If you're going to change the matter of an oath, and you offered four, then now you would have to offer six. He literally says, in order to change the nature of an oath, or rather to change the conditions of an oath, if you offered, say, four dollars to somebody, you now would have to offer six dollars. The only appropriate way to change an oath is to offer more than you originally offered. And actually, the math of it is 50% more than you offered. So if I offer you $100,000 for a job, and then I say, oh, actually, I want to change, uh, I want to change how much I pay you. I can't offer you 50, I can't offer you 70, I can't even offer you 120. According to Dante, the only appropriate thing to do is to offer you 150,000. So, which effectively means, can you change oaths after you've made them? No, unless you want to give more than you originally offered. Which, why would you do that? Because you're feeling really generous? I guess, I guess. In any case, in any case, what do I want to talk about next? Oh yes, number five. This is where we're going to end today with a consideration of the absolute and the contingent will. If a vow is broken by the force of another, why would I be blamed for breaking the vow? Excellent question. One would not be blamed if one did not in some way will it oneself. Okay, so there seems to be some idea latent within Dante that Picarda and Constance wanted to leave their convent. Because uh, uh, the point that Dante literally makes is, well, they could have died instead of leaving, and they didn't die, and he gives examples. There's this guy, St. Lawrence, who died on a grill for his faith, and also Musius, who, because his hand offended, he cut it off. Which, those, I agree, seem like very extreme uh, uh, ways of keeping one's oath. And yet, there are people throughout time, including St. Stephen, who have, rather than giving up their oath, done whatever it took to keep it, including giving up their own lives, which Picarda and um, Empress Constance did not do. Now, is Dante saying that you should always be so extreme? Obviously not, because where are Empress Constance and Picarda Donati? In heaven, 
Well, that's the best place you can be. So, does he hold it against them, the fact that they did not perfectly keep their oaths? No. But does that mean that they were slightly inconstant, even though consistency would have uh, taken a huge sacrifice by them? Yes. Now, one last thing. Apparently, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the absolute will and the contingent will too much. But I do want to mention two people. So I'm going to go back a couple slides. Now, there were two characters that are mentioned, Canto 5, 64 to 72. They're Jephthah, who sacrificed his own son in the same way that Idomeneus sacrificed his own son, and Agamemnon, who sacrificed his own daughter. The only condition under which you can break an oath totally is this. If the thing you offered, giving it, results in a worse consequence than not giving it. So think about this. If you have, uh, say, uh, promised Zeus or Poseidon that you will sacrifice your only living child for good wins, I guess it was Artemis in this case, probably it would be better not to keep that sacrifice to Artemis and to deal with the plagues that she would send you rather than killing your own flesh and blood. Dante has, I would say, uh, after giving a very inhuman account of just how good you have to be to keep consistency, gives a very human account. He says, some things you just should not promise. Because if you keep that promise, the world will become worse. Like if you promise to sacrifice your own child to God or a God, probably you should take the consequences of not keeping that promise. Which I think is an, uh, an excellent lesson from old Dante. All right, I know that was a ton, but that's what we had to fit in in the time that we had.